The Sun, an entity worshipped as a god throughout time and across cultures. The source of all life and sustenance for our little blue space rock, and also a force of unthinkable destructive power. But soon humanity will reach out its collective hand and come closer to touching the sun than we ever have before, with the launch of the Parker Solar Probe. NASA put humans on the moon, sent probes throughout and even beyond the solar system, and drove a minivan-sized rover across the surface of Mars. And now NASA will once again attempt the impossible, reaching for the one place in the solar system we've never dared approach. The Parker Solar Probe will fly within a hair's breadth of the Sun itself. Will NASA succeed where Icarus failed? The Sun. A vast ball of incandescent gas, a hundred times Earth's diameter, powered by the giant nuclear furnace of its core. The energy it pumps out, equivalent to a few hundred quadrillion nuclear power stations, provides essentially all of the energy to sustain Earth's biosphere. But that energy doesn't only come as life-giving light. It also bursts from the solar surface, magnetic storms driving a constant stream of energetic and potentially destructive particles, the solar wind, whose origin we see as the solar corona. The corona is deeply mysterious and difficult to study. It's visible to the naked eye only during a total solar eclipse. We still don't understand exactly why it burns at millions of Kelvin in temperature, far hotter than the sun's surface below it. And its mysteries are not idle curiosities. Outbursts from the corona, coronal mass ejections, present an existential threat to our civilization. Humanity is heavily reliant on technology, tech that can be damaged or destroyed by solar activity. In 1859, Earth's protective magnetosphere was disrupted by a massive coronal mass ejection, dubbed the Carrington Event after British astronomer Richard Carrington who observed it. Charged particles travelling at nearly 1% the speed of light bombarded the Earth. Auroras, normally only visible near the poles, were witnessed across the entire planet. The brand new telegraph systems across North America and Europe failed, but not before telegraph operators received electric shocks from currents induced by Earth's compressed magnetic field. An outburst of similar size occurred in 2012. It missed us. If it had happened only one week earlier, that end of world prediction based on the Mayan calendar may have been closer to the mark. The total financial impact for such an event has been estimated at up to two trillion dollars. In 1859 we were just beginning to emerge as a technological species. Now such an event would take years or even decades to recover from. Okay, so maybe it's a good idea to learn more about the sun's surface? We already monitor it constantly with ground-based telescopes and spacecraft orbiting the Earth or orbiting the Sun at a safe distance. So why do we need the Parker Solar Probe? Well, because it won't just watch from a distance, it'll get close enough to bathe in the source of the solar wind. The primary science objective of the Parker Solar Probe, as stated by NASA, is to trace the flow of energy and understand the heating of the solar corona, and to explore what accelerates the solar wind. To do this, Parker is packed with four instruments. There's the Fields Experiment, which is essentially a magnetometer and voltage detector. It'll directly probe the sun's electromagnetic field, and will connect the sun's magnetic activity with the sources of the solar wind. It'll also measure the outward flow of the magnetic field through the pointing flux, as well as the plasma density and electron temperature. Finally, it'll detect radio waves from processes responsible for the acceleration of particles in the solar wind, hopefully teaching us about how that acceleration occurs. The Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas and Protons instrument, or SWEEP, will directly detect the particles that make up most of the solar wind. The most common types are electrons, helium ions, aka alpha particles, and protons. It'll make detailed measurements of their kinematic properties like velocity, temperature, and density. It will follow the flow of energy from the solar corona into the accelerating solar wind and connect the solar wind to its source. Next up is the Integrated Science Investigation of the Sun, or ISIS. It'll capture the most energetic particles of the solar wind, charged particles like electrons, protons, and heavier nuclei, measuring their energies and mapping them back to their origins in the corona. 
And finally, there's the Wide Field Imager for Solar Probe, or WISPR. Really trying hard with these acronyms, guys. This set of two telescopes will actually produce images of the solar corona and surroundings. From that close up, it'll achieve unprecedented resolution of the solar wind, including shocks and other interesting structures. This will provide direct images of the plasma that other instruments are sampling, from which 3D models of the corona can be made, pinpointing the source of solar winds. Together, these instruments work in tandem, creating a complete picture of the environment near the surface of the sun. Of course, as exciting as all of this is, the big question is, how do we make sure the sun doesn't melt them? While we've used heat shields before on our spacecraft or rovers for entering atmospheres, this one is different. It'll need to withstand continuous exposure over many orbits to solar radiation and intense temperatures upwards of 1650 Kelvin, while keeping the instruments at room temperature. For this, a 4.5 inch thick carbon composite heat shield was developed especially for this mission. Perhaps surprisingly, one of the biggest challenges with this mission is getting the spacecraft that close to the sun, even ignoring its ability to survive there. I mean, you'd think it'd be easy. The sun's the biggest object in the solar system and has the strongest source of gravity. Why not just let the spacecraft fall towards it? It's actually much more complicated. To escape Earth's orbit in the outward direction, you first need to escape Earth's gravitational pull and then accelerate to achieve a larger orbit. To move closer to the Sun, you need to first escape the Earth and then lose speed, which can be even trickier than gaining speed and requires just as much fuel. Parker will use the same trick as many of our outbound spacecraft like Voyager or Pioneer, gravitational assists. But instead of slingshotting around planets to increase speed, Parker will do multiple flybys of Venus to reduce speed. At each pass, Venus will tug on Parker in just the right way to reduce its velocity, causing it to fall into a more stretched out elliptical orbit that'll take it closer to the Sun. Venus will end up traveling infinitesimally faster as it absorbs Parker's orbital energy. In total, Parker will do seven Venus flybys. By the end of 2024, if all goes according to plan, Parker will reach its closest approach to the Sun of 6.2 million kilometers. That's seven times closer than any human-made object has ever come. While its orbital period will be the same as Mercury's, 88 days, because of its eccentric orbit, Parker will get roughly 10 times closer to the Sun than the closest planet. There it'll be traveling over a blazing 192 kilometers per second. It'll spend roughly 11 days doing science during each orbital cycle, or spending the other 77 days in the outer parts of its elliptical orbit, when it'll transmit data back home. By mission's end, after nearly seven years, Park will have completed 26 close approaches to the Sun, five of which will be a relative hair's breadth from the Sun where it'll be bathed in the full force of the sun's violent outbursts. There it'll gather the data we need to understand the corona and the perilous solar wind. Humanity has been planning a solar probe since the late 50s, and the dream of flying to the sun is as old as the legend of Icarus. Icarus didn't fare so well, but Icarus didn't have a carbon composite heat shield. This time, if our luck holds, we'll come close to touching our home star to unlock the mysteries of our closest stellar neighbor in space-time. Hey guys, before we get to comments, two things. I want to let you know PBS Digital Studios is conducting its annual audience survey. This survey is one of the most important projects we do every year because it helps us understand who you are and what you like and don't like, beyond what we can see in the analytics and space-time fans have always been a huge help. Last year, 35,000 responses helped us make decisions on what experiments to try and even what shows to make. If you have a few minutes, please click on the link in the description. 25 random participants will receive an awesome PBS DS t-shirt. And fun announcement number two, we've got an amazing new show to introduce to you, Reinventors. It's a new show from PBS Digital Studios that will introduce you to the scientists and tinkerers in the Pacific Northwest on the cutting edge of green technology. They'll try edible plastic and bring you to unexpected places like a garage in Seattle with a nuclear reactor in it. Check out Reinventors and subscribe to them at the link below. 
In last week's episode, we talked about Maxwell's demon, the thought experiment in which the particles in two halves of a box are sorted without using energy, thereby decreasing entropy against the second law of thermodynamics. This was a surprisingly provocative subject. Before I get to the many excellent questions, let me rant a little. I could not rant, but it's a long, hot New York summer here and we have to turn the AC off when we shoot. Ranting just feels good right now. Okay, so some folk, not to be named, objected to the thought experiment of the great James Clark Maxwell, one of the founding fathers of electrodynamics and statistical mechanics, because demons don't exist. Guys, seriously, the demon is a metaphor. It represents some physical system that can detect incoming particles, measure their velocity, and then open the door based on a decision about that velocity. Also, a couple of people thought that the whole thought experiment was just stupid, and they had a simple, obvious solution. Okay, so I would never support the mindless appeal to authority. Just because it took 100 years and some of the greats of physics to understand the Maxwell's demon conundrum doesn't necessarily mean that the solution isn't obvious. But you know, it's not a bad indication that there might be some subtleties that one's immediate gut instinct might miss. Listen, don't be afraid to question the conclusions of our best geniuses. That's how scientific revolutions happen. But also don't be afraid to question your own instincts. Physics is not intuitive and takes real methodical work to verify those instincts. Okay, so with that out of the way, several of you had a very good insight. Surely, when you open and close the gate to admit the particle, you use energy. And if energy is coming in from the outside, then it's okay for entropy to decrease. Well, actually, no, it's possible to have a perfectly reversible gate. For example, a compressed spring that, when triggered, opens and closes again, returning it to its initial state. It has to be the act of telling the gate to open and close again that expends energy. I'll address that in the next comment, which is this. A number of you very reasonably point out that the demon or device doesn't really need to remember anything to do its job. Right, it just needs to trigger to open the gate and then it can forget. But that's still a memory of one bit that needs to be reset after every action. Let's look at just one specific example of a gate. Say you have this reversible spring-loaded gate. In order to not continuously bounce open and close, it needs a latch. That latch can be thought of as a very tiny activation energy that needs to be overcome to set the gate moving. That energy can come from the incoming particle and it can be returned to that particle reversibly by either the latch or the gate depending on how you set it up. So an incoming particle is detected and the latch releases, the gate opens, closes and the particle passes through without losing any energy. The only thing that remains is to relatch the gate. That also requires a tiny bit of energy. You could have multiple latches in place, primed and ready to lock whenever they detect the gate closes, but eventually you'll need to reset them. The resetting of the latches is not a reversible process. Returning the system to its initial state this way is analogous to resetting the memory of the daemon, where the state of each latch is one bit of information. Remember, Maxwell's demon is just a metaphor for many potential types of physical gate. Master Therian noticed that Maxwell's demon's memory was in the Enochian alphabet of Dr. John Dee. There followed in the comments some nice discussion of Judeo-Christian demonology, in which some of you are surprisingly well versed. A few of you even tried to translate using the standard Enochian to English table and got complete gibberish. Are you really surprised? Did you think metaphorical physics demons are limited to our paltry three dimensions? That their writing is one dimensional? Come on, people. 